um, what I want to do is explode two myths, Christian myths, in this talk. The first myth has to do with who we are as humans. The second myth has to do with what is the Bible. Those are the two myths I want to explode in this. They're going to be absolutely essential to explode. Now, most of us tend to think of ourselves as autonomous individual units or persons, right? So there's this figure called Michael Harden, and he has his own desires, and he has his own thoughts, and he has his own wishes, and he has his own dreams, and everything that that comes into my head is mine. You with me on this? Now, that is a myth. It's actually, Rene Girard calls it the romantic lie. <laughs> and it's, um, it's been perpetuated, again, it, it, it has its roots, you know, in, um, in Greek philosophy. Uh, you can see trends toward this kind of thinking uh, in the Jewish scriptures. Um, and just so you know, I don't like to use the phrase Old Testament because there's nothing old about the Old Testament and there's really nothing new about the New Testament as collections of literature. So I refer to the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures. Second thing I don't do is I don't say the word Y-H-W-H. You know, the okay? And the reason I don't say that name is, first of all, in Judaism, it's the unpronounceable name. Jesus never said that name. That's God's name. In fact, in Judaism, when scribes were copying the uh, Torah, or you know, the, what you would call the, the, the law, uh, whenever they were copying and they had to write the letters Y-H-W-H in Hebrew, that pen, or a quill, was now no longer good. They'd pick up another one. Okay? So instead of saying Y-H-W-H, because I don't want to just say God, I'm going to use what the Jews refer to, to Y-H-W-H as is Hashem. Hashem just is the Hebrew word for the name. The name. That's, that's important because um, uh, when you get to Philippians 2 and it says, and God gave Jesus the name above all names, and we go, Jesus, name above all names. You know, we do this whole worship thing. Um, what we fail to understand is that Papa looks at this human being and says, I recognize myself in you, and I'm giving you my name. You are now Y-H-W-H. That's big. You are now Hashem. You are now the name. Um, <clears throat> okay, so those two caveats. Now, we perceive ourselves as autonomous individual units. This is part of the heritage, again, of Greek philosophy. Uh, it comes into Christianity, uh, especially through Augustine. You've all heard of Augustine or Augustine? Okay, lived, um, uh, or did a lot of his writing around the year 400, before and after. And Augustine gives us something that we never had before when he writes his Confessions. How many of you have ever taken a peek at Augustine's Confessions, right? It's the first book in history that uses the word I as a subject. I am writing this about myself. <coughs> before that, nobody thought to do that. So Augustine gives us the concept of the subject, okay? When you get to the 17th century, the 18th century, there develops this notion that we, as human beings, are autonomous, which means we're self-governed. So when you want something, it's because that came out of here. When you think something, it's because it came out of here. And so we perceive ourselves as these little uh, islands in a sea of humanity. Mm -hmm. And 
Now, if you buy that, if that's, the, that, if that's your worldview, how then do you form community? Well, Jean-Jacques Rousseau sat in uh, Europe and he's trying to figure out how do we form community if we're all autonomous individuals? Well, we do it by a social contract. The social contract is the way the entire modern world is formed, including the church. Social contract means this. You and I are going to choose to live together along with you and you and you and you. And so we have to have an agreed upon set of rules and procedures for how we're going to govern ourselves. And we're going to call this our constitution. It's our social contract. We agree that if we go over 55, we should be given a ticket. We agree that mealtime is 5 o'clock. We agree that <laughs> Saturdays are uh, uh, holy days. Whatever it is we agree on, we have this social contract. If you violate the social contract, guess what? You are no longer part of the community. You are now back out as an autonomous individual island. You're isolated. You're, you're marginalized. Christianity has created itself as this Frankenstein monster where we have a social contract. But instead of calling it a social contract, we call it a statement of faith. And every church has one. Mm -hmm. And every church website has one. And the most interesting thing to do, well for me, the most interesting thing, one of the most interesting things to do is to go on these church websites and look at their social contract. We believe. Dink, 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 dink. Now, if you do enough of this, one of the things you'll discover very, very quickly is this understanding that because I'm this autonomous individual, and particularly since we're in a charismatic church, I'm just going to, if I was in a Lutheran church, believe me, I'd go off on the Lutheran tradition. If I was in an evangelical church, I'd go, I'd go off on everybody. So we're charismatic, so I'm just going to talk to that. So we have this view that here we are as autonomous individuals. God gives me the Holy Spirit. God gives me a spiritual gift. God speaks to me. So all I got to do, you know, is sit down in the morning, have my cup of coffee, open my Bible up and say, oh, speak to me, Lord. And then all I got to do the rest of it, the Lord said. The Lord said to me. The Lord told me. That whole business of this autonomous spirituality, uh, this, uh, well, yeah, autonomous spirituality works as long as I fit within this statement of faith, this social contract. Now, if I came up, if I was a member of this congregation, for example, and um, I'm assuming you all uh, believe in all the spiritual gifts and the manifestation of the gifts and all that, that stuff. Okay. And if I came in one day and I said, the Lord told me that um, uh, the gift of teaching uh, is no longer for today. You know, look at me. Yes, you do that. <laughs> you know, right? right? Be because you know better. Right? right? Um, I I'm not allowed to come in and break that social contract with something that is uh, outside of that framework, okay? Now, we're going to come back, maybe, maybe, to this business of, of this, but one thing I want to point out to you is that in the 20th century, psychology, philosophy, literary theory, and now in the physical sciences, the study of the human brain, has demonstrated that there is no such thing as Michael Harden. I do not exist as an autonomous unit. What's real is all the relationships that I'm embedded in. Shad Fitzpatrick is not real. Michael Harden is not real. What's real is the Michael Shad relationship. That's real. In other words, we're not made up of these uh, individual autonomous things like will, I have my own will. People, I love people talk to them, they go, do you, have, do you believe in free will? And I go, no. Are you a Calvinist? No, no, no. What I know is from just neurophysiology, 
that I want what you want. I copy your desires, <laughs> you know? Uh, so you and I, we're best buds in high school, man. We're hanging together one day, and you look over and you say, ooh, she's pretty. And I look, and I, and I want what you want. I may have never noticed her before, but because you want her, I want her, right? And now Madison Avenue gets this, and this is why every commercial you watch on TV, you ever noticed, it's only the good-looking people yeah. in advertisements, right? And if they're not so good-looking, they're dolled up so they're sort of good-looking, right? And I love the ones where they go, these are not actors, they are real people. Yeah, well, you know, where'd you get them? <laughs> you know, for crying out loud, find somebody that looks like this and put them in an advertisement once in a while, will you? Um, so we're not, I don't have my own will. I want what you want. I think what you think. You say to me, you know, I've been reading, um, uh, I don't know, Martin Luther. Oh, really? And you say, yeah, he's very exciting. Well, next thing you know, I'm going to start reading Martin Luther. I'm, I'm going to get all excited, too, because you're excited. I want what you want. We are not isolated, autonomous units. We are relational beings. We are in relation, three primary relationships, and this is what the biblical tradition communicates so brilliantly. We are, first of all, whole beings. We are in relationship physically, relationally, and spiritually all at the same time. That's why you can go stand on the beach. You're in relationship with the ocean, the sound of the waves, the sky, the sunset, whatever it is, the birds. You're in a physical relationship. And the next thing you know, the person next to you is snuggling up because it's romantic. Now, this beach scene that you're in this physical relationship with, you, you appreciate the aesthetics or, or the, the beauty. Now, you're, you've got this other relationship here. And this person snuggles up and you're, you're, you know, you're holding arms and you're looking out. And next thing you know, you're thinking about God. And the beautiful creation. You're doing all three things at once. You're in all these relationships at the same time. You are embodied relationality. Okay? So, <clears throat> good, solid Christian theological thinking never divorces one's relationship to the physical world, to the creation, from one's relationship to each other from one's relationship to God. Christian, good Christian theology doesn't do that. Most Christian theology has divorced those categories completely and entirely. So the first thing is, we're, is we move toward really understanding Jesus. If we want to get Jesus, we have to understand that for Jesus, Relationality with the creation, relationality with each other, and relationality with God are all part of one dynamic. You with me on this? Okay. And that's why it is so cool to walk out in the natural world. And the first thing you do is you're looking and you be, oh, that's a pileated woodpecker, and that's a, an oak, and there's Spanish moss. Oh, that's really, and you're, you're loving it, you're appreciating it. Maybe you have a little bit of a Native American thing, and so, you know, you're going to touch it and sense its energy, or whatever you're going to do. And the next thing you know, you're praying. It, you're just moving back and forth. So, for example, the great commandment, the great commandment. The guy says, what's the greatest commandment? Single, one commandment. And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's not two commandments. There's one commandment. You cannot love the Lord your God without loving the other. You cannot separate them. You can't, you know, so... so they're, 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 they're together. By the way, that's why when Jesus replies, what's the greatest commandment? He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. 
That's the Shema. That's the prayer. That's the opening of the prayer that a male Jew prays twice a day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus starts with that one thing that everybody does every day. And then he proceeds to show how two commandments are one. That's good. Okay? Now, the flip side of this is go look at the sheer amount of nature metaphors in Jesus' teaching. Look at the birds of the air. Look at the lilies of the field. A farmer goes out to sow. I mean, Jesus is constantly referring to the natural creation and using that as a metaphor to help people understand that this embodiedness, this fleshedness, this physical reality is spiritual and the neighbor counts you cannot as first john says you cannot say i love god oh you're hungry too bad <laughs> you're homeless suffer with the you know you can't do that you can't love god I'm spiritual. I pray three times a day. I read my Bible. I go to some Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night Bible study. And I'm in the choir. And I serve on the elder board. Look how spiritual I am. <laughs> you know? Go away. You can't do that. It's one reality. So the first myth to explode, if you really want to get Jesus, is that life is relationality. It's all about your relationships. And that's why the emphasis in Jesus' teaching on forgiveness is so important. Because forgiveness is all about the relationships this way. But, and I'll just tell you, this is what makes it even harder. Is when the guy says, oh, love the Lord your God. <coughs> I got that part, Jesus. Love your neighbor. I got that part. Uh, who's my neighbor? The guy needs a definition because we tend to think of neighbors as those that are part of our in-group. Right. I like you. You're a neighbor. You're in my mentoring groups. You're all my neighbors. <coughs> other folks, I haven't added them as friends yet. They're not neighbors, right? Or I can treat you as that you're the enemy. You're the one that came and bombed my town. Well, that's when Jesus proceeds to tell the parable of the Good Samaritan. Yeah. It's the enemy that's the neighbor. Love your neighbor means love your enemy. You can't not love your enemy as a Christian. You cannot say, oh, they're the enemy. They're bad. They're evil. They're apart from me. I have no relationship with them. No. You are related. You are, you are embodied relationality. You are related to everything on the planet. You're related to everything in the universe. As Joni Mitchell put it, you are stardust. I mean, think about this. Every single quark and muon and gluon in your body, and there are trillions of them, come from somewhere. And ultimately, it all goes back to stardust. You know, we're all one. We are, it's, an, it's what, what Ken Wilber calls an integral worldview. We are all one. There's no difference between me and that oak and that fox and that crow and shad and the sky, the air I breathe. Life is this awareness that I don't exist in a vacuum. I am my relationships. That's the first myth I need to explode. Here's the second myth. What is the Bible? Now, if you go to these statements of faith that are really theological social contracts, if they are influenced by the Reformed tradition, this includes all evangelical traditions, all fundamentalist traditions, all charismatic traditions, the first thing statements of faith are going to say is, we believe the Bible to be blank. Some of them are hardcore to the, we believe the Bible's the inspired and errant word of God. And then there's people that are slightly more nuanced or liberal. We believe the Bible is the inspired, infallible Word of God. Then there's those that we believe the Bible is the, is the inspired. Um, uh, how do they put it when they're a little more liberal? 
we believe that God speaks through the Bible. And, and then, of course, you get to the liberals way over here, and it's like, the Bible? <laughs> but when you start with the premise of this perfect book, you have now locked yourself into modernity, and you cannot change. Mm. Once you've defined this book as the place where God reveals God's self, this, you want to know about God? Read the book, you know. Once you've done that, now you have to spend your entire Christian life trying to figure out why there are problems in the book and harmonize them. So, I have a lot of fun. You know, again, my Facebook friends know that I, I am um, I'm the bubble buster out there <laughs> on Facebook. By the way, one of my favorite sayings, mostly because I have had to learn this the hard way, comes from a Chinese philosopher named Lao Tse. The one who feels punctured must have once been a bubble. <laughs> so I like puncturing theological bubbles. Now, let me just ask you this. You have the Bible written in three languages. Ninety-five percent of the Jewish scriptures are written in Hebrews. Small portions of Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Daniel are written that these are not accurate numbers, just teeny portions. It's probably more like 99 and 1, are written in Aramaic. The New Testament is written in Greek. So what happens in the 17th century is you've got these scholars come along and they go, oh, the Bible's inspired, the Bible's perfect, <clears throat> and God dictated the original manuscripts. Remember this? You've all heard this before, right? So you got these original, these alleged original manuscripts, and they're perfect. And now if you're a, a Calvinist or a Reformed or an Evangelical, you have to spend all of your time trying to prove that the Greek text type, this is a phrase I'm going to use a lot now in this talk, that the, Greeks, the Greek text type that you're basing <coughs> your view of the Bible on actually is 99.9999999% is what you're using here. Now, just in case you don't know this, <coughs> um, this is a, it, it was, still is, it's a pretty bad this is a Greek New Testament. At the bottom of every page of this Greek New Testament, you can look at this later, is a list of critical apparatus telling me that certain manuscripts say this and certain manuscripts omit that, and certain manuscripts add this, right? All this. Over 4,000 different Greek manuscripts. Scholars have to kind of figure out, and there's a whole science behind this, by the way. It's not guesswork. It's a science. Uh, what could be reconstructed as an original manuscript? Now, how many of you grew up in a King James-only church? I say, okay. Now, the King James Version <clears throat> is based upon what's known as the Textus Receptus. That means the received text. And this text was, was uh, in the New Testament. It's just with reference only to the, New, to the Greek New Testament. Uh, was first put together by a guy named Ara of Erasmus of Rotterdam uh, just before the time uh, of Luther's Reformation and Luther and Erasmus got in these, these battles. Uh, Erasmus was the good guy in this case. <laughs> I love Luther. I love Luther. i got a big picture of him in my office, but Luther is not the Pope. <laughs> he just wanted to be. So what Erasmus does is at that point, all anybody's reading is the Latin Vulgate, and the people don't speak Latin, so nobody gets to read the Bible. And Erasmus is part of this movement of the Renaissance, and they're saying, we've got to get back to original sources. So Erasmus goes around and collects Greek manuscripts as he finds them, and they're all, you know, 13th, 14th, 15th century, and he combines these dozen Greek manuscripts together and creates this text type, known as the received text except that the book of Revelation is incomplete, and so he has to use the Latin Vulgate to retranslate back into Greek, and in the process he actually makes up words that don't even exist in Greek. 
And that text now becomes the Greek text behind which the King James writers are going to translate the King James. And so it becomes absolutely absurd at this point when the King James only people go, this is inerrant, and it's based upon these inerrant manuscripts. It's absurd. Erasmus made stuff up at the end of the Bible. At the end of the Bible where the writer says, do not add or subtract to these words, Erasmus is making up words, you know? <laughs> now, you come to the modern age, bang! Discoveries in the 18th century, we've got Greek manuscripts and papyri and palimpsests coming out our ears. And they have to sit and organize them and, and they create another text, a Greek text that's different than the King James. And then we base translations off that. The New American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New International Version. In no case are we able to say with certainty that what we have is part of the original autographer or the original manuscripts. In no case. What we can say is we think to the best of our ability, we've, we've reconstructed it. That's the best we can get. Even when 99% of our manuscripts agree, that does not mean we're certain. So if I was a charismatic, for example, um, when it came to the Lord's Prayer, and I said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's the next line that you know? Thy will be done. Now, there are manuscripts in the early church that read, Thy kingdom come, let your Holy Spirit come upon us. Wow. Yeah. If I was charismatic, I'd be going, That's original! <laughs> 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 so, yeah. so it, that's just the Greek. Now, take the Hebrew text. Just take the Hebrew text. In, in um, your modern Bible, in your modern Hebrew uh, uh, Jewish scriptures, you know, you've got these chicken scratches that, you know, right? That's not Hebrew. That's just chicken scratches. <laughs> and what, what has happened is um, you can have a word uh, in Hebrew that can be mean different things because Hebrew has no vowels. I mean, they're pronounced. But in Jesus' day, they were never written down, Right? So if I come across some Hebrew manuscript and I read that, now, just shout them out. What vowels can we add to this set of consonants to create words? Just o and E. Say the word. Dove. Dive. Dive. Wait a second. <laughs> Dave. Dave. <laughs> what else? Diva. Diva. <laughs> <laughs> now, is this a verb or a noun? Is it referred to the bird or to the act of going into the water? Yeah. Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so <laughs> what, what the rabbis did was they, they, of course, over the course of time, they didn't want to let, you know, uncertainty linger, so they started adding what we call vowel points to the text. And this is in the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. And um, eventually they come up with what's known as the Masoretic text, because the Masoretes are the guys that create the text. And this becomes the standardized text for Judaism. <clears throat> and it now has vowels. And so by the time the Reformation comes along, they're using the standardized text. Well. If you go back and you take out all those vowels and you say to the translators, we want you to use the best knowledge you have, the scholarship you have about everything you know about Hebrew, the ancient Jewish world, everything else, and we want you to repoint the text that is put in the vowels you think are there, right? So we're going to erase that and we're going to put this, we're going to erase this, and we're going to put that, and you, know, and you, you do this. You end up with a translation that's very different, don't you? How many of you have a Jerusalem Bible? Okay. That's a Catholic Bible, by the way. But the Catholics are confident enough that they could say to their scholars, repoint the text. And if you have a Jerusalem Bible and you have something else next to it, like an NIV or a King James or an NASB, and 
you're looking at these two translations, you're going, there's no way I'm looking at the same book. Because the, the Jerusalem Bible translators have repointed the text. So that's the first problem. Now here's the second problem. You go back to Jesus' day, and um, Hebrew, for the most part, is what we would call, uh, it's not a dead language, um, but it's basically uh, an unused language, except amongst the elite, uh, the scholars, the scribes, these kinds of folks that are copying Hebrew texts and co uh, writing uh, contracts in Hebrew and this sort of stuff. What you have in Jesus' day is not a single Hebrew text that is copied perfectly everywhere and every time. And we know this because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain lots of scriptures. And there are lots of differences between what's in those texts and what's in this Masoretic text. Are you with me so far? In addition to that, 200 years before Jesus, there's a lot of Jews scattered around the Mediterranean, and they don't speak or read Hebrew, they speak Greek. And so somebody got the great idea, hey, why don't we translate the Jewish scriptures into Greek? That's called the Septuagint, and they did. The New Testament writers never, ever, ever quote the Hebrew scriptures. They always quote the Greek scriptures. With me on this? That's a translation that they're quoting. And it's really, really different in a lot of places than the Hebrew text. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, could not have written his epistle if he was going to cite a Hebrew text. I'll give you just the one example. You know in chapter 2 where the writer's trying to make the case that Jesus is human, he's really human, and he says, and Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, right? And he's going to quote Psalm 8. Well, what you have in the in Second Temple Judaism is this view that there's God, there's angels, and there's humans. Now, prior to the exile, remember, you know what the exile is? It takes place 722 to, to 587 BCE, north, first, and south. Prior to that, you can sneeze, sweetie, it's all good. <laughs> Oof, don't hold him in. <laughs> so, that's the inverted sinus man speaking. So, you have, prior to the exile, there's no view of angels and demons. There's no view of the afterlife in Judaism. Why? Because the Jews have not yet been influenced by Persian Zoroastrianism. They haven't been carted off where they have to deal with this Babylonian religious viewpoint and philosophy. But after 70 years there, they've imbibed enough of it that now they have a God and a Satan. There's no Satan before this in Judaism, but there is in Zoroastrianism because there's a good God and an evil God. And so they bring that into their thinking. They bring angels and demons into their thinking. And now they created a worldview where you've got God, angels, humans. Now Psalm 8 in the Hebrew text reads... And if you have a Bible, you can look this up. What, and I'm sorry uh, about not um, uh, being uh, gender inclusive here. I'm just quoting from the old King James memory that I have. What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou shouldst care for him? Yet you made him a little lower than God. Ooh, that's kind of cool, isn't it? We all like that. God, humanity. Yeah. Made in the image of God. That's what the psalmist is doing. Now, fast forward from whenever that text is written to about 200 years before Jesus. The Jews are going to translate this text, and they come to this word Elohim, which you all know often refers to God. But it's a plural noun. It means gods, uh, plural. But it's used of God, singular. And they come to this text, yet you made him a little lower than Elohim, well, they've got angels in their theology, so they're going to translate Elohim, gods, as angeloi, angels. With me on this? So now, the writer to the Hebrews needs to be able to demonstrate that Jesus is not an angel. 
He's not some superman, as Tito pointed out earlier, some, you know, super angelic being. No, he's really human, really flesh and blood. So he says, Psalm 8 says that you made him a little lower than the angels. Now that's only going to work if you use the Greek text, not the Hebrew text. With me on this? See? So when these people come along and say, the Bible's inerrant, the Bible's inspired, I don't even start with the so-called errors in the Bible. I start with the problem of texts. That's a reality. Now, of course, if I really wanted to mess things up, I'd say, why is it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that Jesus celebrates a Passover meal, and then he's arrested, tried all night, and crucified the next day? We call that Good Friday, right? Right? And that Passover meal takes place Thursday night. And you go to the Gospel of John, and Jesus gets, he has a meal, doesn't say what kind of meal, and he gets arrested, and he's tried all night, and he's brought before Pilate. In John chapter 18, verse 28, it reads, The Pharisees refused to go in to where Pilate was at because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. In other words, they didn't want to become ritually unclean because Passover takes place the next, well, that later that day at nighttime, which for the Jews, of course, is the next day, right? This starts at sunset, right? In other words, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus dies on Friday. In John, he dies on Thursday. <laughs> now, do you suppose God was in heaven and he said, God, I forgot. Did I tell Matthew, what did I tell Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Um, well, I don't remember. Anyway, <laughs> he died on Thursday. You know. <laughs> God suffers dementia. Who knows? Do you, see, do you see the problem already here? Right? And that's to say nothing of all kinds of other issues in the Bible. Why? In the old, Jew, in the Jewish scriptures, oh, I almost said it. <laughs> Why in the Jewish scriptures do you have God commanding genocide? <coughs> Why in the Jewish scriptures does God have an anger management problem? Why in the Jewish scriptures does God, does, is, is, is the writer able to say, a blessing from God is on you when you take the babies of your enemies, hold them by their little feet, and bash their heads against the rocks? <laughs> Next, a blessing is on you. Who wrote that text? God did. No. We have problems here, don't we? <laughs> Lots of problems. <laughs> so when we come to the Bible and we say, if it's not perfect, what is it? What we have to learn to do is approach this text the same way Jesus did. And what we're going to do in the next talk is look at how Jesus approached this text. He added words. He omitted words. He changed the text when he felt like it. Now, I don't know if that makes you uncomfortable, but it certainly makes me uncomfortable <clears throat> because I have to go, Oh, Lord. If Jesus changed the text, that means Shad gets to change the text on Sunday mornings. You know, I don't know how comfortable I am with this, you know. Unless it can be demonstrated that Jesus had a very specific way of changing the text. That is a consistent interpretive approach. Yeah. And I'll give you one example um, before we break. <clears throat> uh, who knows their Bible pretty well if I ask them to, to quote something to me? Okay. You're nodding your head there, bro. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> just kidding. Okay, so quote me the great commandment. The scribe says to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor. That's pretty interesting. I've not heard anybody do that publicly before, and I want to hang on to that. He said, love your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> now, is that what Jesus said? 
if no. you if you have a, a, a Bible and you were to look up Deuteronomy chapter six verses four to six, you would see that Jesus, as I pointed out earlier, says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." That's the first part of the great commandment. So, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now, you quoted the Deuteronomy version perfectly. Nobody's ever done that publicly before. Congratulations. <laughs> Which says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Jesus is the one that adds the words, and your mind. In other words, one of the realities for Jesus, as he looks around his culture, is he's dealing with people that don't think. Why are you doing that? Because oh, I'm supposed to do it. Why are you doing that? The rabbi said do it. Why are you doing that? God's will. These are people that don't think. They're just like Christians today. You know? I'm, I'm really serious. This is, this is a, if not the biggest problem in the church. We've taught people not to think. Don't think. I'm the pastor. Listen to me. I have the anointing. Listen to me. I went to seminary. Listen to me. I write books. I'm the favorite speaker. I'm charismatic. I, I, listen to me, 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 and do everything I say. And make sure you put money in the plate on the way out. And we do this. And people, so they come to church, and people don't want to think when they come to church. At the door, they go, chink, put my brain here, and I'll pick it up on the way out. They think about everything else except for when they come through the church doors and sit in the pew. And then it's whatever the pastor says. Give me a congregation of people who think. The power of the gospel lies in changing our minds, changing the way we think. The verb repent in Greek, metanoia, means change the way you think. Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your soul. No. Be transformed by the renewing of your spirit. No. No. Be transformed by the renewing of your rules. No. No. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Jesus adds the words and your mind to the greatest commandment. If you really want to irritate Christians, just tell them, love the Lord your God with your mind. Mm -hmm. Think. That is right? Good. So that's just one example. It's If you look at Jesus' teachings, you will notice that he uses a device. It's the consistent device in his ministry that forces people to think. We call them parables. Parables are not stories with morals. If you read a parable and say, I know what this means, you haven't got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am 40 years in biblical studies and to this day, there are parables I don't understand. <laughs> they just, I, they boggle my mind. Parables are brain teasers. You ever pick up those books at the airport, brain teasers, you sit and do them on the airplane, right? That's what Jesus was doing in parables. He was trying to get people to think. He was trying to shift their worldview. But he can't do it directly. He can't just come out and say, oh, by the way, you've got a bad view of God. Let me correct that I'm the son of God. He can't do that because the first and only time he does it, it almost gets him killed. And that's the next talk.